So welcome back again, um, whether you took a break or whether you just simply click to continue on with the recording. Let's talk about these concept check questions or the answers to them before we move on and talk about the Calvin cycle. So what is the function of reaction center of a photosystem during the light reactions of photosynthesis? Remember, it's the two chlorophyll A molecules in the reaction center that generate the high energy electrons, which are then captured by the primary electron acceptor. So what is the role of the reaction center? To generate high energy electrons in response to captured light energy. So that's what this is all, that's what the, the reaction center is all about. And to capture that light energy in the form of high energy electrons that can be passed on eventually to be used for the reduction of NADP plus to NADPH. What role do most of the chlorophyll molecules in a photosystem play? Well, obviously, given that there are several hundred chlorophyll molecules, but only the two reaction center chlorophylls generate the high energy electrons, those other chlorophyll molecules have got to be doing something. And that something is capturing light energy. Remember, they're an antenna complex, much like a satellite dish that captures energy and directs it into the reaction center, just as a satellite dish um, directs energy to the little amplifier box in the center of the dish. So these antenna um, chlorophyll molecules, and we actually refer to it as an antenna complex, um, direct energy into the reaction center to increase the amount of energy available for making high energy electrons. What is the role of water as a reactant in photosynthesis? Well, it is the source of the electrons that are going to be boosted in energy um, by the captured light energy to eventually be stored temporarily as high energy electrons in NADPH. So water is our source of electrons that are going to be pushed uphill to NADPH by the captured light energy. So that's the role of water as a reactant. So having generated our ATP and NADPH in the light reactions, we now need to put that energy to use in reducing carbon dioxide to sugars. That's the function of the Calvin cycle. It is named after Dr. Melvin Calvin, who figured out with his research group how this takes place. And he did so by tracing the uptake of carbon dioxide by using carbon-14, the radioactive isotope of carbon. And he tracked the path of that carbon-14 through the various molecules that make up the cycle so that he could show how carbon dioxide was incorporated into organic molecules using the chemical energy of ATP and the electrons of NADPH. Now, in the equation, we've shown that glucose is the byproduct of photosynthesis or is the organic product of photosynthesis. That is somewhat correct. The vast majority of the output of photosynthesis does ultimately wind up as glucose, which will be temporarily stored as starch in the chloroplast. What is needed elsewhere in the plant will be converted to sucrose table sugar, and transported to where it's needed, whether it be down to the roots or up to growing leaves that are not able to do to support themselves through photosynthesis just yet, or anywhere else in the plant that needs a source of energy. Any excess is going to be stored temporarily as starch and will likely be used overnight when there's no light energy to allow the plant to continue growing. But while we keep emphasizing glucose as a product of photosynthesis, it is not the direct product of the Calvin cycle. A smaller sugar is actually the direct product of the Calvin cycle. And you've actually seen that sugar once before. You may not realize it, but you have seen it once before because it turns out to be an intermediate in glycolysis. So when we split glyco um, glucose in glycolysis, 
the three carbon um, result is a sugar called glyceraldehyde three phosphate or G3P. I don't need you to know the name glyceraldehyde three phosphate, but I would like you to remember G3P. If you also learn glyceraldehyde three phosphate, that's, that's great as well. But I really want to emphasize that you know the term G3P because that is the direct product of the Calvin cycle and therefore the direct product of photosynthesis. But given that G3P is a breakdown product of glucose, it stands to reason that if you want to make glucose, you can using G3P. You ultimately get two G3Ps when you break a glucose down. So to make a glucose, all you need is two G3Ps and manipulate them correctly through chemical reactions and you can make glucose. From there, you can make just about anything else you want to make um, because either G3P or glucose or sucrose or some derivative of those sugars can be used to make pretty much anything else the plant wants. So we need to remember that G3P is the direct product of the Calvin cycle. And in fact, remembering that makes the Calvin cycle a little bit easier to remember and to understand in terms of how it works. So here is the book's diagram of the Calvin cycle. It's okay as far as it goes. I'm going to add a little bit extra here so that you can see um, exactly how this process takes place because it's really a mathematical issue or a math issue. Um, I I'd like to refer to it as carbon math because it helps make sense about what you're doing. And what's going on in the, in, the, in the cycle. So if we bear in mind that G3P contains three carbons. Let's see if we can get this right. Just as we saw in the citric acid cycle, whatever we take out of the Calvin cycle, we have to replace. Remember in the citric acid cycle, we took out two carbon dioxide, so we had to replace those with the two carbons from the acetyl group. Here we're taking out a three carbon sugar, the G3P. So if we're going to take that out as our product, we need to replace that. We need to replace those three carbons. Well, those three carbons come in as carbon dioxides. So we need three carbon dioxides. It turns out that those three carbon dioxides are each added to a five carbon receptor molecule called IUBP. So we need three of these. And these are five carbons. So it's three by five carbon, which equals Fifteen carbons. And so when our three carbon dioxides come in and each is added to with this five carbons, what we get is a very, very temporary six carbon molecule. These are extremely unstable and they're very, very temporary. It's in essence, as soon as they form, they break. So each of these three six carbons I'm trying to think how we should do this. I'm going to move this down. I have a little bit more space for the moment. Let's see if we can do this. CO2 plus RUBP equals 6C. And you put in here unstable, very unstable, in fact.
So that's where these three carbon molecules come from. The six cut, the very unstable six carbon molecule splits instantaneously into two three carbon molecules. So we have three by six that then when they all split gives rise to six by three carbon and that's a total of 18 carbons in the form of these six three carbon molecules. We then use the ATP and the NADPH that we got from the light reactions. One ATP for each three carbon molecule, one NADPH for each three carbon molecule. So six ATPs, six NADPHs. And what we wind up with down here is six G3Ps as the product of doing all of this chemical manipulation. We then take out our G3P molecule that is our product. And that then leaves over here five G3Ps. And remember, G3P is a three carbon molecule. So five times three, that's not going to work out very nicely. So let's erase that. That equals 15 carbons. So we're back with the 15 carbons that we started with. The problem is these are three carbon molecules. We had five carbon molecules. So there's a little bit of more chemistry that goes on. And in the, as we go through that chemistry, um, we use a little bit more ATP, three more ATPs, and that gives us um, the three RUBP molecules that we started with that picked up the three carbon dioxides at the beginning. So this is how the cycle goes around. And each of these stages or these steps is given a name. So I think I can move this back up and I'll give you the names of the three steps. Because um, I kind of think it's important that you know the names of the steps. So what do I want? Yeah, I'll do it in green. So this is called fixation. This is called reduction. And this is called recovery. So the binding of the carbon dioxide to RUBP and the resulting three carbon molecules that eventually emerge from that, that's the fixation step. Then the use of the ATP and the NADPH to create the G3P, that's the reduction step. And then the reforming of the RUBPs from the, G, the re, remaining G3Ps after we take out the one that is our direct product, that's the recovery step. So those are the reasons the three steps of the Calvin cycle. So that's how we get our G3P. And remember, once we've got the G3P, we can make anything we want. We're a plant. Well, plants are plants. And we can make, and the plants can then make anything that they want from that G3P, whether it be glucose, which a lot of it will turn into, sucrose, which some of it will turn into for transport elsewhere, or amino acids, fatty acids, you name it, any organic molecule the plants are going to make it from. from the G3P starting point. So that's in essence what you need to know about photosynthesis. I've given you a little bit more detail than is present in the book. If you know what's in the book, if you know what's in the, the learning objectives, you'll be fine. I'm not going to ask you any questions about the more um, advanced stuff or the more detailed stuff that I've put in there. But I wanted to put that more detailed material in there simply because it allows you to understand 
a little bit more of what's going on so that you can see why certain things take place and why we think certain things about the process of photosynthesis. But concentrate on the learning objectives because that's what I want you to know. That's what I expect you to know. So coming back for a moment to this question of biofuels again, because the book finishes up with a short section on um, modern biofuel research. One of the real issues is that it takes millions of years to turn the remnants of living matter into fossil fuels. It takes pressure, it takes temperature exposure, it takes time. And that's the reason why we don't expect to see huge increases in the amount of available naturally occurring fossil fuels, because it just takes too much time to generate those. So the only alternative we've got to use organic molecules as a fuel source, if we want to continue with doing that, is to take advantage of the ability of plants and particularly of algae to carry out the production of organic molecules that could be used as a fuel source, in other words, to make biofuels. But they're not terribly efficient at doing that. And so the last part of the chapter, the last little section of the chapter, talks about experiments that are ongoing right now to try and use an artificial selection process, sort of a parallel to natural selection, which would increase um, or potentially increase the ability of the algae to make biofuel if natural selection was in fact going to select for that sort of thing, but use a process of artificial selection to increase their ability to make biofuels by artificially mutating them and then selecting those that are uh, those mutants that are more efficient at making biofuels and artificially mutating those and seeing if you can improve the ability to make biofuels. At the same time, people are trying to incorporate um, enzymes, particularly enzymes that are involved in some of these synthesis pathways into the, the algae that are being experimented on that are more efficient, but are found in other organisms. In other words, genetically modifying the algae. When I was involved in um, plant research, when I first moved to Florida, one of the groups that I was involved with had connections to a group that was just beginning this work. This was about, oh, this is going to be the best part of 25, nearly 30 years ago now, when I first came to Florida. And we, the research group that I was a part of at the time had a collaboration with a research group that was just beginning the genetic modification of algae to improve their ability to make biofuels. It was tedious work because um, it's not very easy to genetically manipulate photosynthesis because of its presence in the chlorophylls. This is not something where you can just manipulate the nuclear um, genome, the genes in the, in the chromosomes in the nucleus. Here you have to, to focus on the genes in the chloroplast and that's a whole different um, problem to solve and it's not easy to do. But some headway has been made um, and I know before I left research about 20 years ago or well, there were 25 years ago, um, they, the, our collaborators had actually started to see some results in their attempts to genetically manipulate the algae that they were working with. Now, I haven't kept track of what, what's been going on with the research, but um, my guess is that they have been, not only this research, but other research groups have been somewhat successful in being able to more efficiently and more effectively generate biofuels because people are now talking about producing large quantities of biofuels for commercial use. Um, so contracts are being signed to produce um, biofuels for 
commercial aviation. Um, several test runs have been done um, on airliners burning biofuels, both here in the United States and in Europe. Um, the United States Navy has actually flown some of their fighters using biofuels, a mixture of biofuels and regular fossil fuels. Um, so at least biofuels are starting to enter the mainstream as supplements to um, fossil fuels, not replacements yet, but supplements to fossil fuels. And not so, it shouldn't come as much of a surprise that the military has been a major funder of this research. After all, uh, we rely on fossil fuels that are in part derived from imported crude oil. And that puts us at the, um, I'm trying to think of what the right word is now. Um, I've drawn a blank, but it means that we have to have to be careful because we could be cut off from that supply at any time. There are any number of reasons why it could happen. I'm old enough to remember when we had the oil embargo and that meant that many Western countries could not produce gasoline because they weren't getting any oil. Um, and so the military has been actively involved in funding research into biofuels so that they can um, become less dependent on imported oil, I guess, is probably the best way of putting it. Um, but that has also had benefit for um, non-military uses because um, with the military funding this and supporting the development of the technology, it's, it's not that big an issue to expand the, te the technology to support um, non-military uses. And we're starting to see that happen as well. So you've seen biodiesel. We talked about Willie Nelson at the beginning of the presentation. Um, and I've mentioned commercial aviation using jet, um, bio jet fuel. Uh, and there are any number of ways uh, that we may be able to generate um, sustainable biofuels, but there's still a lot of research that needs to be done. But nonetheless, um, this is an ongoing area of research. And this is just a, um, a photograph of a experimental device with algae in it, hence the green color. Um, and these are algae that have the potential to make biofuels. And so this is a little um, biogenerator, I think is the correct term to use for this, um, where you put in the algae, you give them a light source, you give them the raw materials that they need, carbon dioxide and water primarily, and then measure their ability to produce the different um, organic molecules that you're looking for to use as potential biofuels. Again, a research area for the future. And if we had um, a greater opportunity, I'd tell you about some other exciting research that's being done that is looking at some things that plants are able to do that we wish we could do um, in terms of generating alternative sources of energy. But um, we really don't have enough time um, in this class to get into that detail. But if you're interested, come and see me during office hours and maybe we can talk about that as well. Anyway, that's photosynthesis. So one more concept check and then we're done. So here are the concept check questions. And obviously we're not going to take a break even though it says time for a break. We're going to wrap it up with this. So what is the function of ATP and NADPH in the Calvin cycle? Well, these are the energy sources. Remember, they are generated in the light reactions to provide chemical energy, ATP, and reducing power, the electrons in NADPH. So that's the function of ATP and NADPH. These are the energy sources for the reduction of um, carbon dioxide to sugar. A classmate insists that the light reactions do not require the Kelvin cycle in order to function. How would you respond to this? 
Well, we do know that the Kelvin cycle requires the light reactions because it's dependent on the energy sources generated by the light reactions. But do the light reactions require the Kelvin cycle? And the short answer is absolutely they do. The longer answer is remember that in the light reaction, the electrons are being used to reduce NADP plus to NADPH and some of the energy in the from the electron transport chain is being used to drive the synthesis of ATP from ADP and phosphate. Well, where do the ADP and phosphate and the NADP plus come from? They actually come from the Kelvin cycle. So if the Kelvin cycle did not use up the NADPH and the ATP, there would be no NADP plus and ADP plus PI to be processed in the light reactions and the light reactions would stop. So in fact, the two stages of photosynthesis are dependent on each other. They are intertwined and interconnected and one is not going to function without the other. And that is something that if we were to talk about some of the modifications to photosynthesis to allow plants to grow in more hostile environments like deserts and hot, dry, uh, hot um, dry places other than deserts, um, you would find that that interconnection becomes even more obvious um, because of the way the modifications take place. So you can't separate the light reactions from the Kelvin cycle. Yes, the Kelvin cycle is dependent on the light reactions for, the, for its source of energy, but likewise, the light reactions are dependent on the Kelvin cycle for the reactants that are processed using the light energy um, in the light, reactants, the light reactions. So your classmate would obviously be wrong here in insisting that the Kelvin cycle is not required for the light reactions. Both stages are required for both stages to function. So that brings us to the end of this presentation and our look at um, photosynthesis. Uh, for those of you who have been finding the chemistry a little bit of a challenge, the good news is that at this point, we have completed the pure chemistry section of the course. From here on out, we're not going to be focusing as directly on chemistry anymore. We're going to be looking at more cellular processes rather than chemical processes. But before you jump up and down and go, yay, um, remember we still need to have the exam on this chapter. So that exam is coming, coming up in a little bit over a week, about a week and a half from now. Um, so if you have any questions or concerns or comments about anything that I've covered in this chapter, um, by all means, um, come and see me in office hours and we will try and sort out the conflicts. In fact, I think I've just made a mistake about in talking about the exam, ignore you everything that I just said about the exam. In fact, just ignore everything I said about the exam. I'm realizing now that I'm thinking about one of my other classes, not appropriate for this class. So just ignore everything I said about the exam. So yeah, say yay about the, the chemistry. We're, we're not ready for the next exam yet. Just ignore what I said. Anyway, I'll see you back here for the next presentation when we are going to talk about cell division and the requirement for cell division. Till then, um, be careful. I'll see you at the next presentation. Bye for now.